Hello and welcome to the Presbyterian Church in Westfield, where we're getting back to the basics of how to live faithfully in uncertain times. And to do this, we're going to dive into a book that is often left to the margins, that is overlooked very often uh, within the Bible, 1 Thessalonians. And why, you might ask? Well, it's because the people it was written for lived in a world just as unhinged as the one we live in now. Okay, so first things first, I think it's important for us to talk really briefly about why Thessalonians matters in the first place. I mean, for me today, I personally see it because of the time in which we find ourselves, this time in which we're living. To me, it just makes perfect sense. You see, people then were not so different from us now. They lived and they loved, they paid taxes, and they died. They also fought, they argued, they tried living good lives. They wanted meaning in life. And the people in this little church in Thessalonica, which at the time was the capital city of Macedonia, um, they, they, they were finding their lives transformed. Something sparked in them. And, and it did so because through Paul and the other leaders of that early church, they encountered something in the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. And I think that remains just as true today as it did then. And even more than that, theirs was a troubled world. Living at that time in the Roman Empire was troubling, especially if you were a person of Jewish descent or if you were a person who had converted to this new way of, of spiritual life. Now, the, the, the people in this little church felt that society was just as unhinged as we see it today. They, too, wanted to, to find another way to live, another way forward. Like us, they wanted to know how to stay faithful in uncertain times. So this letter, to me, holds all the meaning necessary. The letter starts with Paul pouring out affection for this little church and, and reminding them of how much they had learned from him and from Timothy and these, these other leaders who had gotten the church started. He also reminded them uh, of how much others in that region of Macedonia and Greece had been influenced and changed by the model of this small community that was trying to follow Jesus. These people are generous, and they're generous with their everyday lives. They're generous with their time, their energy, their resources. They seem to be living in, in such a way that they are immediately inclined to, to help, to serve, to be focused on, on, on the needs of others ahead of their own interests. And people have taken notice. So Paul is talking about the influence of changed lives. When our lives change, it has a powerful effect on others. So let's take a moment to hear it in Paul's own words, okay? So this is actually coming from the first 10 verses of the letter, uh, the first letter to the Thessalonians. So he writes, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grant to you, or grace to you in peace. We, we always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of people we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit. So that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the people of those regions report 
to us about or report about us what kind of welcome we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son his son from heaven from whom he raised from the dead Jesus who rescues us from the wrath that is coming okay so that is those 10 verses now before we go on i think we need to pause for just a moment That last line that I read, I'm going to go ahead and read it to you again. Paul says, how you turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us. And this is what I want us to pay attention to, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. All right. That last line seems a bit curious but it's actually very intimately connected to everything we just heard. You see, Paul seems to be, at the surface level, he seems to be talking about being saved by Jesus from the wrath of God. And that a whole bunch of pastors in the past at least a couple hundred years have read the English translation of this. And I want to emphasize the English translation of this. And has seen it to be about the anger of God that has to be appeased And they were saved from this wrath of God, this anger of God, by the killing of the Son instead of us. It puts the crucifixion as a way of separating God's wrath from us by focusing it on on Jesus and killing of Jesus. So this is one interpretation, but something a little closer to the original intent uh, is, I think, necessary to remember. And It's also in keeping with the ancient church itself and and how it would have been um, almost these words would have been an an intentionally said reminder uh, or drawing a picture of the Passover instead of how it often gets portrayed. So while a lot of pastors do kind of focus on this being about the anger of God having to be appeased, I'm not completely convinced and quite frankly, most scholars are not convinced that that's what's actually happening here. Instead, the imagery of the Passover is really rich. So I want you to stay with me for just a moment as we talk about this. You see, there was a common perception at the time that the end of the age was coming, right? And that there was this impending judgment just on the horizon. Now, for those who worshipped idols at the time or had many gods that were polytheistic, There was a giving to the gods in order to placate that god, to keep them happy so that anger would not come, resentment wouldn't come, and that punishment wouldn't come, to be frank. But Paul, in this this little letter, is actually pointing the people back to what he's calling a living and true God, and that in Jesus they are spared any judgment. Now, if we read it this way and remember the imagery of the Passover about this living God who sweeps over the land and those who are believers who have responded are are held from judgment. That whole last line is actually about faith and hope and living in the love of God, about being God's own people. It also fits perfectly with the theme that there is something beautifully infectious, if you will, about this faith, this faith that tries to follow Jesus, about this way of living spiritually in the world. It is not based on fear or power or control, but instead on hope and faith and love. When he talks about avoiding that wrath, he's talking about the entirety of judgment will simply skip over you because of this living and true God represented in the life of of Jesus. And what the people in Thessalonica witnessed in Paul changed their lives. Then they met others, and these other people have been smitten by what they encounter. And that contagion effect of one person encountering another that have all been struck by the beauty of this life of Jesus and this true and living God, That contagion effect of what happens when one person, right, catches the spark of faith is wrapped up in a line that I love from Paul and that came just a little bit earlier from there. And he put it this way. He says, we always give thanks to God for all of you. Now, to be frank, it feels a little too bubbly. It feels too much. But what if Paul's not being hyperbolic? 
What if Paul's not trying to write something that's just effusing too much emotion to make them feel good about themselves? What if, what if Paul really feels that way about these people? Paul encountered something in, in Jesus in his own personal life that seems to have permanently shifted his outlook on life. And so now he's talking to this little church in the, you know, this, this north of Greece, and he's filled with what, with expectation about what God might be doing through them. And so he starts to talk about it. Paul believes that, that, that one person can change the life of another, and he has seen it in that little community. It is in, as inevitable to him as watching one domino topple another and then another until the whole line picks up momentum. And as long as there is another domino to meet, we all know exactly what will happen. One after another, they act on each other. So let's put it another way. If we step back from this reading and understand what, what, what Paul is, take, is trying to talk about, about how this community encountered Paul and Timothy and these other leaders and they started to understand they had this encounter with Christ that changed them, and now they're changing others. It reminds me very similarly to um, a video that I watched at this point a few months ago. I can't recall. It feels like all the days, the weeks, everything have all merged together for me. But a few months ago, I, I watched a video uh, interview of um, Professor Hugh Montgomery, and he's not very well known here in the States, but he's the director of, of the Institute for Human Health and Performance at the University College in London. Um, and he was talking about the difference between the flu and, and the coronavirus pretty early. I mean, I want to say this, that the original interview may have been back as far as like March. But what he's trying to do is he's trying to clarify people why this, this coronavirus is different from the flu. And he talked about what's called the contagion effect. He's, he was talking about how when we get the flu, we're likely to spread it to, on average, 1.4 people. Now, obviously, people are not decimals. So we're talking about the averages, right? But what it means is if we spread, on average, to 1.4 people, that means that as this flu, this flu spreads from us to others, that over 10 cycles, if we were the starting point and it goes 10 times through, an average of 14 people have been infected that started with each of us. So if I get sick, I spread it to 1.4 people. At the end of 10 cycles after that, 14 people total have been infected with me being ultimately responsible for it. Well, he puts that into context with the coronavirus. And on the flip side, what he says is if, if one of us, let's say me, gets COVID, I am more likely than not to actually infect three people. And this change doesn't seem that big on the outside, but what it means is that on average, after the same virus, after this virus has been able to spread from me to others over that same 10 cycles, up to 59,000 people could have been affected, starting with little old me. You see, the idea is that one becomes three, and each of those becomes three, and so on, and over 10 cycles, the exponential growth is just massive, unless it is actually curtailed unless we're being responsible, wearing our masks, being socially distant, etc. Now, I'm not saying this to try to get into the politics around this particular illness or anything else, but instead saying that the way in which we relate to each other, come into contact with other, at a biological level can spread illness. If we step back and we talk about that concept from a religious or faith perspective, we can see why it is that Paul is so excited. Paul has seen something very similar to that contagion effect with this church in, Thessal in, 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 um, in Thessalonica. You see, he's experienced it firsthand. He's experienced firsthand, in fact, how one meaningful encounter with Jesus can change one's whole perception of the world bringing peace and joy and hope, even in the face of tremendous obstacles and conflict. But not only that, but he's seen it in this church. He has seen this church change lives, and he knows that with each new changed lives comes 
another, and then another, and then another. And when people catch that spark, there's no stopping it. Faith becomes infectious. And as terrible a phrase as that might be for the time in which we live, it is true. Faith and hope and love become something that we see in others and we can't help ourselves. We follow it. See, Paul sees the power of transformation at work and he starts this letter by naming it. He starts this letter of trying to help people learn how to live faithfully through these uncertain times by naming the power of transformation. When it seems that all the world is falling apart, Paul is reminded that none of it, none of it, hinges on our best efforts, but on Jesus, the one through whom we remain connected to the living God who cares for us and will sustain us through any crisis. Our unhinged world is hungry for exactly this sort of hope, and it, re it rests on each of us. It rests on you. It resides in you, and ultimately, it is your life that will make it real for people who need this kind of hope so badly. Friends, the opening lines, the opening lines of this letter to the Thessalonians shows us the importance of changed lives. Your life, what little spark you may have of faith in Jesus, of putting your hope, your trust on Jesus, is exactly what the world needs at this time. Remember this, and peace be with you.